Hello and welcome to the Pi Podcast, the show by members of the Raspberry Pi community for the Raspberry Pi community. I'm Joe. I'm Isaac. And I'm Albert. Coming up, we'll be speaking to Ubuntu Mate developer Martin Wimpress and covering some of the news. But before that, a bit about ourselves. So, Isaac. Yeah, I've been a software developer for five years now. I've had my Raspberry Pi for a couple of months now. I uh, love it. Love the stuff I can do with it. And I also run a Raspberry Pi meetup here in Washington, D.C. And I uh, got one of the first Raspberry Pis. I've five of them now, so getting a little bit addictive. I run the Eggham Raspberry Jam, and I mainly play with uh, projects involving the GPIO pins and getting things to, to do stuff. Ah, well, that's the opposite of me. I'm a Linux user for, well, I have been for many years now. And I got the very first Raspberry Pi, the 256 megabyte one, uh, directly from Pete Lomas at Og Camp, I think in 2012. And I've got the very latest uh, one, the, the Raspberry Pi 2. But I've never really done that much with them. And the reason I wanted to do the show was to learn as much as I could about them and try and get playing with the GPIO pins and learn about some cool projects. So hopefully we'll speak to some interesting people and learn a lot more about the Raspberry Pi. So with that then, let's do some news. First up then, the big news that's been around the internet is Windows 10 Internet of Things Core has finally got a public release. And so anyone can go and download it and chuck it on the Raspberry Pi. Did uh, either of you guys do that yet? Because I tried this and had, I don't know if I did it wrong or whatever. I had no luck. There was a lot, it looked like, that I had to go and do. Well, you do need a Windows 10 desktop or at least a Windows desktop. And as I said, I'm a Linux user, so... So that might have been my, my problem. Yeah, if from a personal point of view, it doesn't really appeal that much to me. But I think it is good news. I mean, first of all, it shows that the Raspberry Pi has really gone mainstream now. Now Microsoft is interested and has actually produced an image for it. And I think that you are potentially going to end up attracting a wider audience to the Raspberry Pi because some people might be put off by the Linux thing whereas now Windows is familiar to more people so hopefully it'll get more people involved and maybe make them discover that yeah there's some things you can do with Windows and then there are other things you can do with Linux so it might even get people involved with Linux as well. Yeah I think that's definitely the case I've, I've seen at the jam that you know some of the kids are coming along with their parents who are professional developers and as you'd expect, a lot of them are Windows developers, so they're comfortable with the Microsoft tools and the Microsoft environment. And when they flip into uh, Linux to do work on the Raspberry Pi, they're kind of delayed in the support and the help they can give their kids in learning how to do things with the Raspberry Pi. So this is going to make a big difference because the dev tools are exactly what these people are used to using. Mm. I'm expecting to see more uh, blog posts and, and articles online about parents helping their kids do things with, uh, with Windows 10 on the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that same thing in my meetups, Albert, that people have been starting to slowly ask about win, Windows 10. So so thank you, Microsoft, for bringing families together. So that's one <laughs> one good thing. But uh, I did notice they got support for uh, for several languages. And I, I don't understand why you would want to ever code in like C Sharp or C++ or Java when you're doing the Raspberry, anything on the Raspberry Pi. But they have support for Node.js, which I'm a big fan of. So I do kind of want to take it with that a little bit. Yeah, and choice is always good, isn't it? It's you've now got Linux, you've got Windows, Risk OS, and it just means that it's open to a wide audience, and that can surely only be a good thing. Definitely. And uh, for the next new story, looks like we have the new Snappy Core has been released. This is looking very interesting. It's something I haven't had a chance to uh, to play with yet, but the whole idea about what Snappy is and how it works, it it just sounds sounds like it could be good. I definitely want to know more about that. Yeah, it seems to be the way that Linux is going, containerization, rather than the traditional way of doing things. So it, it feels like the future. And again, it's yet another different thing that you can do with the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, I agree with, uh, with Albert completely. I, I really want to get my hands on this. I, I want to see how easy this is to use and maybe create another, just my own image maybe for the Pi. If it's, if it's really that easy as everybody's claiming it is, it, I, uh, there might be a whole load of images suddenly appearing for the Pi. So I think that would, I definitely need to spend some more time with it. It's been the one one thing on the downloads. I haven't really looked much into it all. And then for the gamers out there, there's a new uh, version of RetroPie. RetroPie 3 has been released. I had a, a look at the release notes on it, and this is looking really good. I installed RetroPie 2 something or other on my B+. 
and I spent ages just figuring out how to get the, the gamepad working. But they've actually integrated that now into the main graphical interface. So it means that you get to configure your gamepad not only for the menus, but also for the emulators all at the same time when you start out, which will make a huge difference because it means it's, it's, you don't drop to a, a terminal to effectively configure your gamepad. So I'm really looking forward to that. And they've also moved some of the emulators out of, out of beta into mainstream so they're confident in the capabilities of the emulators, which is just brilliant. Yeah, and you can play all sorts of emulators on it. You know, the, the Mega Drive or the Genesis as it is in America, even up to the PlayStation, which is uh, quite impressive. Oh, yeah, buddy. I already have no life as it is. And when I read this story, I am about to just just sell my soul on the weekends <laughs> to play every single game from my childhood. And I've got, a, I've got a date with a couple in particular that I'm going to defeat this time. That is for sure going to happen. Yeah, I, I had, as I said, on, on uh, version 2, I had the uh, PlayStation emulator running on the, the B+, plus and not the 2, and it ran very well. I had it running oh, Gran right. Turismo, and it ran really, really, really well. So I'm excited to see what it does with RetroPie 3 and on the, the 2B. That, that should be a match made in heaven. Oh, excellent. And so next, a story about the Oxford Flood Network using Raspberry Pis to detect rising water levels. And it's a system using Arduinos that talk to Pies and then report back. And people can volunteer to, to set these up. And it just is a good way for them to monitor potential rising floodwaters. So it's, it's good to see that, you know, there are fun things you can do like RetroPie, but then there's also really serious things you can do with the Pi as well. One of the things I love about this project so much is because the inverse of this part project is true as well. So not only can you detect rising waters, you can detect lowering waters. And I've seen uh, projects where people have hooked up pies in the same concept for their house plants when they needed to be watered. And especially here in the States with areas like California and Texas, they're like getting seriously drought heavy. Stuff like this could really come in handy to detect like when things are like lowering as well as rising. So I think this is a really cool concept. Yeah, it's good, and I I, I love the uh, the Raspberry Pi Arduino combination. Uh, I must admit, I, I tinker and play with both of them, so it's great to see people picking the right tools for the right project. So in this case, Raspberry Pi plus Arduinos, brilliant. And it looks like the Pi Wars are coming up this December fifth. So do you guys have anyone selected that you want to win, or any? Albert, do you have a robot you're going to enter into the contest? Uh, no, no robot this year. I definitely want to get one for next year, but uh, not, not this year. I need to learn a little bit more about robotics to be able to do that. Is this the second year for that? Is that correct? Or the third? This is the second. So last year okay. was the first one, and uh, by all accounts, it was, a, it was a roaring success. They had a, a great time, a large number of entries, a lot of variety in the robots. I think there was one that wasn't competing that was a, a walking robot. So uh, it's well worth getting up to Cambridge for it if you, uh, if you can. Do you guys have like a Robot Wars on TV there in England? Is there going to be like a one there, Albert, with like the buzzsaw hooked up to it? <laughs> not, at, not at the Pi Wars, not that I know of. But yeah, back in the day, we had the, the Robot Wars on television. And yeah, I, I still watch the repeats because it's still great fun to watch. Looks like the next couple of big dates for this, if anybody's really interested in the Pi Wars, is September 1st is when the competition rules will be finalized and also uh, August 26th, when the uh, spectator tickets will be going on sale. So I, as I would love to attend this. But I don't think I'm going to be in the area anytime soon. So hopefully one of you two can maybe attend and get some interviews or something. It'd be great. Yeah, I've seen the some of the competitors sort of tweeting that they've been uh, accepted for it. So I think, uh, I think the build is on at this stage. I know um, Leo White uh, competed last year, and I, I've seen some of his build. Uh, blog posts. Uh, he's he's busy building away at this point as well. So it'll be interesting to see what he's got going on. So one that you put in, Isaac, was that there's a developer seeking funding for a remotely operated underwater vehicle that's powered by a Raspberry Pi. Uh, yeah, I saw this story in the Pi Pod uh, newsletter, and it seems that there is a one Sam Groom, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name, that's seeking to take his project of an underwater ROV to the next level using GoFundMe.com. And I think he's trying to purchase some uh, better motors and hopefully just see how well his uh, project does. So if you're listening to the podcast and uh, please check out Sam's project and, you know, just give a dollar or two. It isn't, you know, that much, but those add up real quick. And I think that would greatly uh, benefit Sam. So that'd be much appreciated. 
And the, the great news for those who like uh, their print media is that the Magpie Mag- magazine is uh, now going to be available in stores. To begin with in the UK, it's at WH Smith's. For those who don't know, the Pi Mag is the, it was the community created Raspberry Pi magazine. It's now come under the uh, assistance of the actual Raspberry Pi Foundation. So they've brought it in-house. They've brought in a, a dedicated team to make it even better. And part of what they've been able to do is get it into the uh, eBooks for, for Apple and Android devices. And now they've gotten it into print media in the stores. And it, for those who haven't downloaded or read any of them yet, there's 36 of the magazines already available as PDFs to download or to buy. And it's great if you're looking for inspiration. So, Joe, you mentioned that you're looking for inspiration. There's there's 36 episodes worth of the uh, the Magpie magazine that can give you details on all kinds of software and hardware coding and, and projects and interesting and exciting things to do with the Raspberry Pi already out there. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, this uh, this magazine I promote heavily at my meetups, and it keeps you uh, a very well-informed Pi user. And uh, yeah, I think in the States, they're selling it at Barnes & Noble if you're not into the whole e-books thing, so... Yeah, definitely check it out. I don't care what you're doing right now. Uh, just stop what you're doing and immediately go buy this magazine. <laughs> it is definitely worth it. If you're if you're in the middle of work or if you're taking your wife to the hospital, just you know take a detour and go pick up this magazine. Because even like uh, we talked about the retro pie stuff and the latest uh, issue talks a lot about retro gaming. So it kind of goes hand in hand. And uh, looks like the last story we have is a Kickstarter project called Mycroft. Have either of you to I know this was talked about on Linux uh, Unplugged recently. Have either of you two looked into this? I've looked into it briefly, and it sounds really interesting. It's kind of using natural language processing and uh, Raspberry Pi to basically control everything if you want it to. You, you know, it's an artificial intelligence that can play media and control lights and just automate your home in a kind of really smart way. And it's got 22 days to go as we're recording this. And it's almost halfway there, so it's looking like it should hopefully get kickstarted. And uh, I look forward to checking it out if it does. Yeah, one of the intriguing things it it, it it's powered by uh, Snappy Core Ubuntu, so this could be one of the first real indications of what uh, Snappy Core on the Raspberry Pi is capable of. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited about this because I was saw, watching TV the other day and there was an Echo commercial, and I just you know I thought like that's cool, but that's Amazon's you know, thing. They're not going to let me in on the source code. And I love the fact that you can, you know, alter the source code or do what you want. And like somebody was saying, uh, you could even add in your own uh, functions, you know, then you could like, hey, Minecraft, do this or that. So in my case, recently, I've been looking at uh, Kali Linux or Kali Linux, and I could easily, you know, figure out, be like, hey, Minecraft, hack my neighbor's wireless. And that would be really cool. <laughs> Uh, not that you'd want to do that or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm really a fan of this. And uh, quote me, I don't, I don't know if I'm right or here. If I donate money to the Kickstarter and it doesn't reach the amount it needs, do I still get one of these things or what's going on? Because I want to donate and get one, but. You don't donate until it reaches uh, the end of the, the pledge period, which, as Joe said, is 22 days for now. And they only get it if it's fully funded. Oh, wow. So they get, they get it's all, it's basically an all or nothing, which in my head is the best type of uh, crowdfunding project. Because if you think about it, again, I don't know in this case, but in another project, we say if they needed 200 grand to build something properly and they got 80 grand and got to keep the money, well, they probably wouldn't have the funds to do it correctly. <laughs> so in this case, point. 99 grand, they're halfway there, 22 days to go. Um, I've seen it about on social network a little bit, but I haven't seen it uh, as promoted as I would expect, considering the kind of places I hang out online. So I, I'd say this is going to make it, and it's going to be amazing to see what people can do with natural language, with the Raspberry Pi 2, with connected devices, with snappy core uh, Linux on it. It's, it's just going to be amazing to see what this can actually do in the end. And then, because it's open source, where the community take it. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to get one. I really want to get one, too, because you could change its name, and I, and I love Star Trek. So I'd be like, computer... <laughs> do do this so it's i'm really amped up i don't I, if, at first i'm not a big fan of these ideas because even on their kickstarter they talk about if it's listening too much or this or that but i just love that it's it's just a raspberry pi powering it and then um the source code is you know mine for the whatever i want to do with it so it's really cool yeah it looks good right then 
That's the end of the news. Let's move on to the interview. We're now joined by Martin Wimpress, who is the lead developer of the Ubuntu Mate project. So welcome, Martin. Hello, thanks for having me on. No worries. So to start with then, can you give us a brief overview of what Ubuntu Mate is? Ubuntu Mate is an operating system for everyone, uh, I suppose. Um, it started out as an idea from Alan Pope, or Popey, some people know him by. Uh, so that's where the inception came from. Uh, the idea was was to make a, an Ubuntu-based distribution with the Mate desktop. Uh, so that combines both Alan and my interests. And from there, I sort of took it as an idea to develop an operating si system that was suitable for my family, some of whom had been using Ubuntu since the 606 days and really wanted to keep that uh, traditional GNOME 2 style user interface. So it's really a distribution for people that like that traditional desktop environment and just want to get stuff done. And so on the Raspberry Pi, what's the main difference between uh, Raspberry and uh, Mate? Ah, well, you're going to test my knowledge of Raspbian there. I believe Raspbian's based on LXDE, is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, so in some respects they're, they're similar in that they're, that's both, uh, they're both a uh, traditional desktop metaphor. I think Raspbian's origins were really developed around the original Raspberry Pi board, so its um, operating requirements are probably far lower than Ubuntu Mate because Ubuntu Mate was designed for PC, desktop and laptop machines. It just so happens that the Raspberry Pi 2 came along, which has sufficient resources such that we could directly transpose the operating system onto the Raspberry Pi 2. But um, in the main, Ubuntu Mate for the Raspberry Pi 2 is very similar to Raspberry and in, term, in terms of the hardware support and the software facilities that are available. Although over time I'm learning that Ubuntu Mate could be better and that's probably because you know, you've got the guys at the Raspberry Pi Foundation working on Raspberry and specifically for their, both their boards and for the makers and the hardware and all the rest. But um, in terms of desktop usage, I think the biggest difference between the two is that Ubuntu Mate is a full-blooded desktop operating system, whereas Raspbian is really a user environment to simplify the usage of the Pi boards. When Mate was announced first, I installed it on, on the Pi 2 because that's what kind of coincided when I got one. And I found the, um, the menus were very slow to begin with. You were explaining that to me at the, the jam recently that there was something specific happening there. What was going on with that? Yeah, the specific issue there is that, um, in particular, it's the, the LibreOffice icons are um, high-resolution SVGs, and those have to be rendered and then cached to uh, present the menus. So the first time you navigate through the menus and you access menus where LibreOffice icons exist, so that's in Education, Graphics, and Office, those pop-out menus are slow to render the first time you pass over them, and then on subsequent visits, um, display promptly. So I haven't implemented this yet. This is one of those bugbears of mine that I've just never quite got round to, but the idea is, is that I, um, I create pre-rendered versions of those icons and deliver those in the artwork packages so that they... Um, they appear quickly. So uh, I've got until October. So uh, hey ho, I might <laughs> hopefully I'll get there soon. But yeah, that's the that's the issue there. Yeah, that, that confused me when I looked at it because uh, Mate just performed fantastically. And then there's just this little slow menu and I was going, what? What is that? I was thinking it was all kind of weird caching things and crazy stuff going on, but it's just big graphics taking a long time to render down. Yeah, and, uh, and it's slow on everything. It's not just the Raspberry Pi 2. It's slightly more pronounced on the Raspberry Pi 2, but um, it affects um, all hardware platforms, more so the PowerPC port, as it happens. So, uh, Martin, does, uh, does Ubuntu Mate support Sonic Pi or Scratch? Because a lot of kids at my meetup play with those stuff, so would they be able to install that pretty easy? Um, it does support Sonic Pi. That's not in the Ubuntu archives at the moment. Um, at least last time I checked, it wasn't. But if you uh, get the necessary devs, you can install it and it works fine. I haven't actually tried Scratch, but I see no reason why it wouldn't work. I've run that on Raspberry and I haven't tried that on Ubuntu Mate. But Sonic Pi I've used. I've actually um, played with that on Ubuntu Mate. 
Would you consider putting that into the next release, maybe, Sonic Pi? Yeah, and some other things as well. So, um, in fact, this was something that Popey suggested, that there should be some of the tools that are commonplace in the Raspberry Pi community should uh, exist pre-installed on the Ubuntu Mate spin for the Raspberry Pi. And I wasn't sure about that at the outset because I was trying to keep it as close to the the PC version as possible. But um, the feedback that we're getting over the months is there are a few Raspberry Pi specific bits that are missing. So for example, some of the libraries for accessing the GPIO pins are not present by default. We haven't included the headers and libraries that you need for Python applications to compile, which are pre-installed in Raspbian, for example. So people that have used Raspbian just expect those things to be there. And there's also a, a kernel component that's missing as well. So I've recently contacted Ryan Finney to see if he would be able to incorporate that because we piggyback largely off um, the work of Ryan Finney and the work that he did to bring the Raspberry Pi adapted kernel to Ubuntu 14.04. And I contacted him and he then provided builds and ports of those um, kernels and uh, flash kernel and the graphics stack for 14.04. Uh, 14.10 and 15.04 and I've asked him if he would be able to do the same for 15.10 as well so um, in the next version in the 15.10 release I won't start making images for that until maybe next month when the Ubuntu 15.10 archives are further along you might be aware that there's been a big effort just recently to introduce uh, GCC5 into the Ubuntu 15.10 archives and a big rebuild has happened and I, I knew that was coming so I've deliberately not done any Raspberry Pi 2 images prior to that because I knew, knew that was going to have a lot of um, shifting ground but um, yeah I'm going to try and uh, incorporate a lot of the bits and pieces that people have fed back to us that they would have expected to be there based on their experiences with Raspbian in the next version. Okay. Now, it seems to be all about Ubuntu Snappy Core, and there's the version of that for the Raspberry Pi. I mean, was there ever any thought to base Ubuntu Mate on that for the Raspberry Pi? Yes, but not now. Personally, I don't know enough about the, the Snappy architecture and Snappy packaging, and I did attend some of the UOS sessions earlier in the year, back in May, to learn some of that and have then uh, re-watched some of those sessions that were recorded at that time to learn what I could. And I've spoken to some of the developers and I have limited time. And the advice I've been given at the moment is to sort of sit back and watch how Canonical develop their snappy infrastructure during this cycle in order to let them work out some of the technical implementations, because they're uh, back in May, they were still discussing how they were going to uh, you know, tackle some of these things. So I'm sort of watching from afar at the moment. So my plan is to keep things on the Deb platform. And at some point in the future, I'm personally very interested in Snappy, and I want to adopt that at some point, and I'm not quite sure when. I'm thinking possibly after 1604, I'll start looking at Snappy with a bit more interest. Yeah, I was going to ask about 1604. That's the long-term support release of Ubuntu yeah. and therefore Ubuntu Mate. It'd be good to get a, a rock-solid version of that on the Raspberry Pi so people know they've, they've got the five years. I mean, is that how long you'd support that? Is that the plan? Yeah, yeah. It's a very simple answer, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> uh, that's the plan. I mean, um, you know, I've got the advantage now of the distribution being official. There's obviously hundreds of people at Canonical working on Ubuntu and all of the core infrastructure and components. I stand on their shoulders there. So all of that engineering work that goes into bug fixing and rolling out new versions and security fixes, I just get for free. So all I need to do is just have a an eye on the bits that make Ubuntu Mate, the Mate piece, and maintain that. And that's a very small, you know, slice of that overall project so yes i don't i don't see why we wouldn't be able to commit to supporting the raspberry pi version of ubuntu mate along with the lts 
I don't know if we'd be able to do the full five years, maybe just three years, but certainly that would get us LTS to LTS. Oh, that's great news. That'd be great. I was thinking, is it worthwhile giving a little bit of detail between the difference between the Snappy Core and the regular desktop Ubuntu? And also, you know, you're saying it's it's probably a couple of years out, but what would the advantages of using Snappy Core on, on something like the Raspberry Pi be? I'm probably going to talk above my pay grade now because I don't know enough about Snappy Core to give you an accurate description of how it differs from the Deb version as it stands right now. But in principle, what I do understand about Snappy is you have a core base operating system that is effectively read-only. And then on top of that, through Snap packages, you then introduce software packages that are effectively delivered. And this is where things are diverging a little bit from what I learned in May and where things are now. Originally, things were discussed. You could deliver the whole desktop environment as a single Snap package. So you could have all of Unity delivered as a, a single Snap, or you could have all of Mate delivered as a single Snap that sits on that base. And then you could have major applications delivered as Snaps alongside that. So, for example, things like um, Firefox and LibreOffice. Those um, snaps for the applications and the desktop environments are isolated and independent from the base operating system. That means that the base operating system can roll and update in an atomic or a transactional fashion, such that if an update fails, you can automatically roll back to the previous working state and all of your applications continue to work. And the same is true of snap packages. You can update and roll back your snap packages that include your applications so uh, you should never have a broken system and in some respects it seems not just um, snappy but um, other initiatives in the in the Linux community are, are seeking to sort of recreate the traditional Unix architecture where the base system in Unix was the kernel and all of the user space tools around around it that all move as a whole. So those uh, tool chains, libraries and kernel, they're the base system, they move as a whole. And then you have your applications that get installed into um, user local uh, independently of the base system. And Linux has never been like that. Linux is a little bit more anarchic and chaotic. And one of the things... I liked about it in that um, everything was stitched together from independent projects and there was never this concept of a, of a base system. Although some distributions have sort of emulated that base system concept along the way. So uh, Arch and uh, Gen2, for example, are examples where that base system exists, but um, it's not separated or isolated from the rest of user land and, um, and the applications. So it's more about the transactional updates and being able to maintain a robust, reliable system. And uh, yeah, no, it sounds like it could be a big advantage because it means all the individual components are, is, uh, my understanding is, are isolated from each other as well. So improve security, improve maintenance, less downtime if, uh, if it all works out. Mm. The security thing, I'll be interested to see how that works longer term. Because if you look at the Docker Hub, for example, where you have effectively, let's think of the containers as applications that you deploy, there's a lot of applications in the Docker Hub that haven't been updated since they were published. And consequently, they have applications within them, web servers and database servers, that have subsequently had security vulnerabilities and they are unpatched in the docker images so the security is only maintained so long as the snap packages are, are maintained and if you look at I, I don't want to single docker out but it's an example that's relevant at the moment and it's not docker's fault it's the issue of who maintains those containers in the docker hub but if you don't maintain them then it introduces security flaws and the same would be true of snap packages that's a really good point there martin because i'm a huge fan of docker for a while now and i totally agree with you and i brought that point up many a times that the security is only as good as those that are posting the uh containers to the hub one question for you is i'm a big fan of linux mint as well as ubuntu mate if i want to create a mint pi image would you suggest me 
building off of what a uh, bunch of Mate's brought to the table or would you suggest me waiting or using snappy core? What do you think about that? Well, I would recommend that you look at snappy core because it's definitely going to be an interesting and emerging technology over the next year or so, irrespective of whether you want to look at snappy or deb packages, you're probably better trying to base that work off Ubuntu or another Linux distribution that has strong ARM support. Um, no, that's a, that's a poor choice for those of you that are old enough to remember what strong ARM is, that have good ARM support. For example, um, uh, Debian or Arch Linux, uh, uh, Alarm as it's known, Arch Linux ARM or Ubuntu, because all of their archives are built for the ARM architectures as well as all of the others. The issue with Linux Mint is that they have their own archives that sit alongside the um, official Ubuntu archives that add all of that minty goodness, but those archives are PC only. So consequently, you can't take all of Linux Mint and make an ARM version because not all of the packages are available for other architectures, where on Ubuntu you've got the 32-bit and 64-bit PC architectures, all of the PowerPC and all of the ARM architectures. And the same is true on Debian and Arch as well, as another example. So maybe not Mint for other architecture supports, but there are other distributions out there that are good for experimenting with uh, other architectures, such as the Pi 2 and the Pi. Okay. Have you heard of any cool projects that have been happening with Ubuntu Mate on the Raspberry Pi then? Hmm. I'm sure I've met this bloke called Albert at a Raspberry Pi jam once, and he had a really <laughs> nifty project, and that's my go-to example of the, the coolest thing I've seen on Ubuntu Mate. So, Albert, what did you make? That was the MindFlex EEG reader, brainwave reader. And it That's basically lets you play a game of Flappy Birds. When you saw it didn't do the Flappy Birds, but I got it to work at the Cambridge Jam. And a lovely guy called Alex Eames did a nice little video on it, which uh, we can link to. Yeah, that's great. And for people that don't know what that means in simple terms, this is a mind-controlled computer game that you created. Yeah, well, we'll definitely be hearing more about that <laughs> in future shows. but. Um, for the time being, then, where can people find out more about Ubuntu Mate? Where's the best place to go to download the image? And Well, uh, you can just go to uh, raspberrypi.org and the download page, and you'll find a link to the download for Ubuntu Mate for the Raspberry Pi 2 there. Or you can go to the ubuntumate.org website, and we've all been very polite and, and well-mannered and called it Ubuntu Mate. But uh, the simplest way to describe it is ubuntu-mate.org, and you'll find a big Raspberry Pi logo on the homepage there, and that will take you to all of the information about the build and how to download it, stick it on a card, and resize partitions and things like that. Great. Well, thanks a lot for giving us your time and joining us on the show, and uh, hope to speak to you again at some point. Thanks very much for having me on. It was great that Martin could make it. I, I met Martin at one of the um, the Eggham jams, and uh, you know, as I said I used it for one of my projects, and it it runs really, really well. Um, the project that I did needed some sound and some graphics, and rather than doing them on my desktop, I just used Mate. I stuck GIMP, Inkscape, and Audacity on it, and I did my sound editing on on, on the Raspberry Pi itself. So the project was one hundred percent developed on the Raspberry Pi. I needed to print out some sheets for the event as well uh, with the graphics, and so I just connected to my printer. I have a Epson wireless printer here, and uh, it just had the drivers built in, it connected over the network to the wireless printer, and it just printed. And I think that's probably going to want to be the, the big advantages of uh, Mate at the moment is that it's a desktop. If you treat it like a desktop, it'll work like a desktop. Uh, I personally, I think if you've one application open, that's fine. Multitasking might be a bit of a challenge for the yeah. Raspberry Pi. But you do one thing, if you've got you know spreadsheet open, if you've got a Word doc open, even doing graphics on it, definitely doable. Uh, GIMP works well. Inkscape is a little bit slower, and I think that's just because it's vector, so it's there's more yeah. calculations going on. But it absolutely was usable, and I used it for graphics for uh, for for the game that I created. Yeah, so that's, that's a good point. I would think about using it as a computer, mainly because I already have Ubuntu Mate on one of my desktops here at the house. But he said they were going to start adding more stuff to it, so I might 
once they come out with a new image with some more Raspbian stuff of this and that, especially the GPIO support, I'll definitely be more than happy to flip from Raspbian over to Mate and give that a shot. Yeah, it's a really good project. And uh, if you're thinking about um, moving away from Windows, then uh, it's a very good place to start with Linux. It's very user-friendly and uh, a great distro. But with that then, we're coming to the end of the first Pi Podcast. If you want to get in contact, you can email show at thepiepodcast.com, find us on Twitter or Facebook, or leave a comment on the website, thepiepodcast.com. Thanks for joining me, Albert and Isaac, and thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks for more Raspberry Pi news, interviews, and discussion. See you later. Bye. See you later.